Hello everyone, welcome to the next review. Before I get into this review of Plenty of the Elder to Natural History, a selection by Penguin Classics, I just want to clarify or make known that of course I've not really been doing as many reviews of late. Um, I do plan to slowly get back into the swing of things, it's just that I'm rather busy of course. Um, I do have a list of books that I'd like to review, everything from the Mabinogion to George MacDonald's Fantasties, uh, House on the Borderland, all sorts of books. But uh, as I say, as I've said on the channel multiple times before, it's rather difficult to review books that I read a long time ago to recall the details. And of course, uh, I read a lot of these books quite some time ago. One of the books that I read about three years ago was Pliny the Elder's Natural History. And I'm not entirely sure why I never picked this one up to review. I've chosen this particular book in connection with the aforementioned problem, the review pro problem, because it's quite a general book and it's quite a good place to, to jump off from, to start again with my reviews. It's been quite a while. I think the last review I did was about two months ago. The world is the work of nature, and at the same time the embodiment of nature herself. Pliny's natural history is an astonishingly ambitious work that ranges from astronomy to art and from geography to zoology. Mingling acute observation with often wild speculation, it offers a fascinating view of the world as it was understood in the first century AD. Whether describing the danger of diving for sponges, the first water clock or the use of ass's milk to remove wrinkles, Pliny died while investigating the volcanic eruption that destroyed Pompeii in AD 79, and the, that natural curiosity that brought about his death is also very much evident in the natural history a book that proved highly influential right up until the Renaissance, and that his nephew, Pliny the Younger, described as as full of variety as nature itself. That's a rather apt quote, I think. It, that's how I think of this book. Very rich, very dense, with, with historical facts and species and rumours and legends. It's, 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 it's very much like the book by the author whose name I can't quite remember just now, but it's... Uh, Trees and Forests and Folklore and Mythology. If you've watched that review of mine, you'll, you'll, you'll be aware of what I'm talking about. It has that similar feeling to it. The cover of this book as well, it really is redolent of that variety as well. The, the kind of the profusion of forms, the, the writhing tentacles of the octopus there, even down to the thousands of little mosaic tiles. It's, it has that, there's, there's a lot in here and this. 400 or so pages, there's a lot in here. And as I say, as I was um, looking at this book to see if it was a, a good book to review, um, to return to, to revisit rather, I, I got a sense of wonder and thrill just by looking at the contents page. Main headings like the universe and the world, covering things like astronomy, Spain and Italy, Europe and Britain, the continents of Africa and Asia, the Black Sea, India and the Far East. Then moving on to zoology, man, land animals, creatures of the sea, birds and insects, then botany, then medicine and mining and minerals as well, there's a lot in here. So I would highly recommend reading the introduction, the introduction is fantastic as you would expect from a Penguin Classics book, but what I find particularly interesting in this is it, it points out a kind of central ambivalence or ambiguity in that Pliny is He's a man of science, but he's also quite, he shows a kind of certain credulity in that he, he's very much, he's not, he doesn't hesitate to put in whatever strange rumours and legends that, he, that, you, that you'll hear of and want to document. He, um, he's very much a man of science and he shows himself to be quite rational. And, um, but that's kind of, as I say, it's kind of contrasted with a, with a strange belief in dog-headed people and the snake eaters of Africa and the pygmies that Homer wrote about and we'll get on to some of these wild speculations in, in a bit but there is of course a lot of history and context that I could discuss here but I just want to, to pick up a particular paragraph here just to give you an idea of what this what the character of Pliny is like here. Pliny and Lucretia share a number of themes. Both wish to explain the universe and its phenomena in rational terms and to free the minds of men from fear through a greater understanding of the world. But their treatments of the subject differ. 
Lucretius writes imaginatively as a poet in Epicurean, while Pliny reveals himself as a scientist with stoic inclinations. He equates God with nature, and an ecologist at heart, develops the theme of mankind's abuse of Earth's resources in its pursuit of an ever more extravagant lifestyle. Perhaps the most significant difference, however, is the wider scope of Pliny's treatment, in which he attempts to provide an exhaustive catalogue of nature. His encyclopedic account of the natural sciences, interspersed with essays and digressions on the achievements of man, contains, according to Pliny himself, some 20,000 facts from 2,000 works by 100 chosen authors. As I say, the quite astonishing variety there. But that paragraph alone really sets the tone for what this work is. It's quite, a, it's quite an extensive and scientific document. But it's also, it also has this kind of unhinged, loose and quite chaotic structure to it where, you, where Pliny will constantly digress. And, and one of the things I find most fascinating about this book is that it's not as dry as it sounds. It might be a scientific compendium of listing minerals and plants and whatnot, but we really get a sense of Pliny's voice in this book. Pliny hated avarice. He hated focus on material wealth. Again, the, again, the stoic inclinations that the... the offer of the introduction talks about. He will discuss in the most neutral fashion the collecting of perils from the sea, but then he'll go on a, a, a big rant about how it's perhaps effeminate and um, indicative of a kind of moral decline that people will put perils in their ears and whatnot. It's quite, it's, you really get a sense of his character. It's quite fascinating. So as we learn in the preface, and of course in the introduction, Pliny wrote the natural history for the Emperor Titus and we get a sense of the character of Pliny and of the nature of the work itself in the preface. Pliny the Elder sends greetings to his friend the Emperor Titus. Most august ruler, let this title, a very true one, be yours, while your father continues to enjoy the title of most distinguished to a ripe old age. I have decided to tell you in this rather presumptuous letter about my most recent production, my books of natural history, a novel venture for the muses who inspire your Roman citizens. And here, a little bit later on in the preface, we get a sense of Pliny's character and again, the nature of the work. My subject, the natural world or life, that is life in its most basic aspects, is a barren one, and in very many instances employs rustic or foreign terms, indeed barbarian words that have to be introduced with, if you'll pardon the expression. We get a sense of the, the Roman disdain for the Germanic tribes and, and whatnot, the superior Roman race. So because I read this book about three years ago now, I'm liable to, to miss out important parts, interesting, interesting and fascinating sections, but I've, I've pinpointed a few that I think encapsulate the work. And as I find these particular sections, I'm just going to flick through each section to give you an idea of the breadth and scope of this work. So starting on the universe and the world, astronomy, various subsections like, for example, the cosmos, sky and the signs of the zodiac, the four elements, planets and suns, the search for God, fortune, comets and their significance, rainbows, miraculous happenings in the sky. So I've come to the first section of real interest here, for me at least, on Mother Earth. Pliny appears to extol nature for what value it, it brings of its own accord and also for man as well but he also seems to show a kind of unfortunate anthropocentrism he will also describe the way in which we exploit nature so there's a lot in here a lot in this first two or three paragraphs or so i'll just try to pick out the best parts mother earth earth comes next the one part of the world of nature on which we have bestowed the title of mother, out of the highest respect, because she deserves this. Earth is the province of men, as the sky is the province of God. Earth receives us when we are born and feeds us after birth and always supports us, and at the very end embraces us in her bosom, sheltering us like a mother, especially then, when we have been disowned by the rest of nature. Sacred for no greater service than that by which she makes us also sacred. Carrying our monuments and epitaphs, prolonging our name and extending our memory against the brevity of time. 
Our divinity is the last to which, in anger, we pray to lie heavily on the deceased, as though we did not know that she is the only element which is never angry with man. It goes on a little bit further to say, in a section entitled Mother Earth's Gifts and Man's Abuse of Them, Earth, however, is kind, gentle, indulgent, always a servant to man's needs, productive when compelled to be, or lavish of her own accord. What scents and tastes, what juices, what things to touch, what colours? With what good faith she repays the interest on what has been loaned, what food she goes for her benefit. Indeed, he actually goes on to discuss such things as poisons and how poisons, natural poisons, allow us to forgo the earth when we are most tired of life and so forth. All these different benefits that the earth provides, even the, those darker ones, we could say. And he will go on to discuss how, despite this, we neglect Earth. Yet so that what she suffers on her surface, her outermost skin, may seem bearable by comparison. We penetrate her inmost parts, digging into her veins of gold and silver, in deposits of copper and lead. We search for gems and certain very small stones by sinking shafts into the depths. We drag out Earth's entrails. We seek a jewel to wear on a finger. How many hands are worn by toil, so that one knuckle may shine. If there were any beings in the netherworld, assuredly the tunnelling brought about by greed and luxury would have dug them up. I was surprised if Earth has brought forth creatures to harm us. So Pliny goes on to talk about man's relationship to nature, but I'll just quickly, before I get to that part, read out a couple of other sections to give you an idea of the scope of the work. Still on the, the universe and world section. The earth and its sphericity, sunrise and sunset varying with longitude, climate and its effects on racial characteristics, historical earthquakes and their consequences. Interestingly enough, um, we go from the world and the universe and the world straight to Spain and Italy, of course. The pillars of Hercules, we come to Europe and Britain, Greece, the Peloponnese, the, the Danube region in South Russia, Mount Atlas, the exploration of Africa, Egypt, the Indus and beyond. So now coming to Book 7, Man. Man is the highest species in the order of creation. The nature of living creatures in the world is as important as the study of almost any other field, even though the human mind is not able to pursue all aspects of the subject. Pride of place will rightly be given to one for whose benefit nature appears to have created everything else. Our very many gifts, however, are bestowed at a cruel price so that we cannot confidently say whether she is a good parent to mankind or a harsh stepmother. Man is the only living creature whom nature covers with materials derived from others. It goes on in quite some length on that point. So again, a strange ambivalence between appreciating nature of its own accord, the, wonder, the wonders and marvels of the natural world, to again showing this belief that humans are of the highest order of creation. And it's interesting, Pliny will have no problem writing about the infinitesimal uh, place of Earth in the cosmos based on current thinking at the time. And, uh, and then he will, of course, espouse the particular belief that humans are the most important. And here, in this section on zoology and man, I'd just like to give you an idea of the strangeness of this book, the curiosities that can be found within it. Megasthenes records that on Mount Neolus there are men with their feet reversed, and with eight toes on each foot. On many mountains there are men with dogs' heads, who are covered with wild beast skins. They bark instead of speaking, and live by hunting and fowling. He's speaking about the Thinocephaly there. He doesn't actually name them, but that's one of the strange races that were recorded in medieval manuscripts and so forth. There are also satyrs in the mountains of eastern India, in the region of Katrakludi. These are very fast-moving animals, sometimes running on all fours, sometimes upright like humans. Because of their speed, only the old or the sick are caught. Tauron mentions a forest tribe called Koromandai, a tribe that has no speech but a chilling scream, as well as hairy bodies, grey eyes and teeth like a dog's. So there's two things here. Again. A very scientific, very neutral, very systematic way of presenting scientific facts, especially later on, 
when he's talking about minerals and so forth and plants, he'll, he'll quite rigorously catalogue all these different species and minerals and so forth. But there's a sense of credulity where, where he seems to take on face, at fa face value these strange races that can be apparently found throughout the world. Another thing I'd like to bring up here is that this book was and still is the inspiration for, part of the inspiration for my Sartorius world, world building project. Uh, some of you may know of this. Suffice it to say, it's a, a fantasy world set in it's its own world, a secondary world, but it's heavily reminiscent of pagan antiquity, heavily inspired in some civil, civilizations by the Byzantine Empire. Suffice it to say, I've written many, many documents and constructed many diagrams on uh, such subjects that the plane describes various peoples and whatnot, various lands. So as I find my next area of interest, I'd just like to read out a couple more subsections to give you an idea. Unusual attributes and examples of outstanding strength, sight, voice and memory. A rather interesting section talks about various Greeks and Romans that are in some way peculiar or of interest. Again, the book is not just a, a, a dry list of various minerals and species. And species. It's, uh, it's, it includes rumours, legends, various case studies of strange encounters, things like this. Caesar and Pompey the Great, Romans of exceptional intellect and so forth. The mutability of fortune, the checkered career of Augustus. And so we come to this particular section here on death and the soul. The activities of the soul outside its bodily home, the revival of people pronounced dead, sudden death, cremation, belief in an afterlife. There is some confusion concerning the spirits of the departed after burial. All men are in the same state from their last day forward as they were before their first day. And neither body nor mind has any more sensation after death than it had before birth. But wishful thinking prolongs itself into the future, and falsely invents for itself a life that continues beyond death, sometimes by giving the soul immortality or a change of shape, sometimes by according feeling to those below, worshipping spirits and deifying one who has already ceased to be even a man. We do this as if man's method of breathing differs in some way from that of other animals, or as if we could not find many animals that live longer, but for which no one prophesies a similar immortality. Again, a fascinating contrast between the belief in human exceptionalism and the idea that man is just another animal. As I look for this book, I'm reminded that in, this, in the introduction, I believe, the author writes about how Pliny the Younger used to observe Pliny the Elder writing this book reading his natural history. I believe it said somewhere that Pliny was so, Pliny the Elder, was so deeply invested in this work that he would, after his duties, he would come home and work on this until the late hours of the night. He seemed to be obsessed and you really got a sense of that, of that feeling when you look at this book. So many different subjects here. The elephant, snakes, lions, the legendary manticore, basilisk and werewolf, interesting blending of real and the fantastic, hedgehogs, the hippopotamus, Alexander the Great's famous dog, horses, bullfights, sacrifices and the worship of the ox in Egypt, simply just on the animal section here, creatures of the sea, oyster beds and fish farms, birds, the eagle as the standard of the Roman legions, so many things here, aviaries, bees, sources of honey, a section on anthropoid apes, Aristotle's belief that physiology provides clues to the course of one's life. There's a particularly humorous part in this book in which he goes off the rails a little bit. He's supposed to be talking about vines and viticulture in this section on Italian trees, but he ends up going on a, a, a quite a digression. The decay of science and the spread of avarice. He talks about how records and, and are being destroyed or, or left aside, and how people don't seem to be interested in science any longer. They're too busy with, for example, worldly affairs. And what was the cause of what was the cause of this? The thing the thing is that other customs have crept in. Men's minds are preoccupied with other matters and the only arts practiced are those of greed. In earlier times people had their power limited to their own boundaries, and for that reason their talents were circumscribed. There was no scope for amassing a fortune, so they had to exercise a positive quality of respect for the arts. 
Accordingly, they put the arts first, and displaying their resources in, in the belief that the arts could bestow immortality. Accordingly, they put the arts first, when displaying their resources in the belief that the, art, the arts could bestow immortality. This was the reason why life's rewards and achievements were so plentiful. He goes on to talk, talk about the expansion of the world, the uh, increase in trade, um, material possessions, people becoming less interested in the grander scheme of things. It's rather, it's rather interesting. He's a, uh, he does seem to have this kind of a stoic quality to him, this kind of ascetic, hardline Roman stoicism, which kind of, which kind of undermines his kind of innate, the, the innate wonder that he brings to the subject. Um, it, it kind of takes away a little bit from it. He's a bit too, kind of the, the, the moralistic side is what I'm trying to say. The moralistic side of things is, is takes a little bit away from it. it's just the sheer wonder of the subjects he's talking about. So as you can imagine, there's a lot in here, a lot that I'm not discussing. I'll just very quickly read out some subjects again, just to finish off. I'll finish off on the arts section. The storage of wine, the effects of overindulgence. Again, there's that sense of uh, discipline, the, the disciplinarian in him. Famous drinkers, beer, olive oil and its uses, the cork tree, early farming, storage of grain, Greek weights and measurements, Greek writers on herbal medicine, drugs obtained from man, magic and superstition, the early history of medicine, the origins of magic, poisonous waters, waters with petrifying properties, Ovid on fishing, gold, we're on to the mining section now, silver coinage, I read all this back to back I should say, it's one thing I forgot to mention, perhaps not the best idea, I, uh, I read all this back to back, it's just a habit that I have, mercury, gold refining, cinnabar, mirrors, the touchstone, and we come to the art section on sculpture and painting and whatnot. Famous Greek sculptors, copper and bronze used in casting, copper pyrites, lead and tin, painting, the painter's palette, a variety of pigments. So I've come to the very last section I'd like to discuss. When I think of this book, there's a particular section I, I always enjoyed and uh, I've remembered it and uh, I'd like to share it with you. This is on the uh, a competition between three artists, Apollodorus, Zeus's son, Theresius. Apollodorus was the first artist to express realism and to confer fame on the paintbrush in its own right. But it was Zeus's of Heraclea in the fourth year of the 95th Olympiad who entered the portals of art thrown open by Apollodorus. In a contest between Zeus's and Theresius, Zeus's produced so successful a representation of grapes that birds flew up to the stage buildings where it was hung. Then Theresius produced such a successful drop the leel of a curtain that Zeusus, puffed up with pride at the judgment of the birds, asked that the curtain be drawn aside and the picture revealed. When he realised his mistake, with an unaffected modesty he conceded the prize, saying that whereas he had deceived birds, Theresius had deceived him, an artist. I particularly enjoyed that section. So I think I'll leave it there. As you can imagine, I've only covered about maybe 5% of this book, perhaps less, but there really is so much to read here. I would highly recommend picking this up, even if it's just to occasionally dip into. The more I read of this book, the more I revisit it, rather, find it fascinating, the more I find it uh, to be actually one of my favourite non-fiction books. The wonder of the natural world, philosophy, science, the way that the people of antiquity viewed the world and so forth. Sunny the Elder's Natural History, a selection. Thanks for watching, everyone.